on how do they do it. How do they mine the world's most important fertiliser from Europe's deepest mine? How do they make the perfect World Cup football? But first, how do they create a flying eye to enable the police to track criminals from the air? We show you how on How Do They Do It? Six a.m. The Mojave Desert. Beneath the blisteringly hot sun in the middle of a Spartan stretch of scrubland, a suspected drugs deal is taking place. What the two dealers don't realise is that they've unwittingly been caught on candid camera by the local police. And with evidence of the crime safely on tape, the cavalry are moving in. It's an unwelcome surprise for the two dealers, who had no idea they were even under surveillance. Drivers, hands up. Go ahead and step out of the vehicle. Keep your hands up. The secret behind their arrest is a brand new spy in the sky, which the LA County Sheriff's Department is putting through its paces in today's exercise. Called the Sky Seer, this lightweight remote control craft is their latest weapon in their war on crime. Hand up to the side. This light plane may look like a kid's toy, but this extraordinary piece of design is based upon some of the most advanced military surveillance technology ever developed. And unlike a helicopter, which is both noisy and expensive, the Sky Seer is silent, hard to spot, and costs just $30,000. But in order to create it, the designers had to overcome some extremely complex design problems. Those designers are based here, at a company called Octatron in Southern California. The problem facing them was that although unmanned aerial vehicles, or UAVs, have been used by the military for years, somehow they needed to create a smaller, cheaper version suitable for the police, as company chief Yu Wen Chang explains. We need something to fly very slow, very quiet, very safe, and also providing good video image. Chief designer Sam De La Torre served his apprenticeship creating special effects for Hollywood movies, so his experience creating unusual devices made him the perfect man for the job. Rather than begin by designing the plane itself, he first concentrated on its cameras. When we were designing this aircraft, the first thing we did was to design the payload. We found that the smallest CCD camera that we could find with the best resolution, we then designed this pan and tilt mechanism as small as we could get it. This ball right here is two inches in diameter. The first camera faces forward and is used for navigation. The second points downward and is attached to a remotely controlled motor, which enables it to tilt and swivel in order to track suspects. But getting the camera to stay trained on target when the target itself is moving is a real challenge. So to make that possible, the Sky Seer is designed to fly extremely slowly. This reduces air turbulence, which means the video is less shaky. It flies nice and slow and uh, that's key when you're trying to see something on the ground. Its normal cruising speed is about 21 knots. A lot of aircraft in this class start flying at about 25 knots. 25 knots is our top speed. The next problem was to make the Sky Seer virtually silent. To do that, they powered it with a rechargeable electric motor, which gives around 70 minutes flying time. This allows it to fly as low as just eight meters without being heard by the suspect below. Obviously, you can sneak up on a target, and uh, the target won't even know that it's there until it's too late. But in order to fly with such a tiny battery-powered motor, the Sky Seer needs to be extremely light. The solution was to mold the body structure out of carbon fibre. First, they take four layers of carbon fibre and soak them in an epoxy resin. These are then placed in a mould and cured at 125 degrees Celsius. After baking, the shell is trimmed, and the end product is a fuselage that is both feather light and tougher than steel. The side frames by themselves are somewhat uh, flimsy, but when you glue it together and uh, it becomes a closed envelope, and now it's a box and it's very strong. 
The wings and tail are then covered in a tough fabric, similar to that used in parachutes. All of which gives the Sky Seer a total weight of just one and a half kilos and a wingspan of less than two meters. But having created such a lightweight plane, the next problem facing the designers was how to steer the craft. Their solution was an innovative GPS autopilot system. By plotting map coordinates into the computer, the Sky Seer is able to navigate itself from one point to the next. And just like a buzzard, this eye in the sky can be programmed to circle over a target, leaving its operator free to concentrate on controlling the camera. The operator, he or she, can flip a switch on the control station and switch into computer and control mode, CIC mode. And now the operator can just focus on uh, steering the pan and tilt head onto the target. What makes that useful is that a single operator can deploy this aircraft. The range on both systems is approximately two miles around there. And uh, if for some reason you were to lose link, it would automatically go into autopilot if it isn't there already, and it would go into a return home sequence where it goes back to where the aircraft first initiated its uh, GPS fix. And if the in-flight movie isn't to the operator's taste, they can simply program the Sky Seer to circle in a better position. Just like a, a full-scale aircraft, where you have an artificial horizon, airspeed, and all the other sensors, all that information is sent back and actually displayed in real time on the ground station. Having created a tough and light design, the final problem for the designers was to make it both easy to transport and simple enough for your average cop to master without a lengthy training course. So not only is the Sky Seer easy to assemble, it also packs neatly into a carry-all, while another flight case holds the remote control, sat-nav system and the all-important video recorder. All of which means the Sky Seer can be unpacked and launched in just 10 minutes. Having been thrown into the air as if it were nothing more complex than a paper plane, it's up to the sheriff to take over the flying duties via the remote control. Minutes later, the Sky Seer is hovering over the suspect and relaying incredibly detailed images to the video recorder. A police helicopter costs around $1,000 an hour to keep in the air. For that money, you could have a dozen Sky Seers flying all day and still have enough change to keep an entire police squad in donuts and coffee for a month. And whilst this eye in the sky won't replace a whirly bird in every law enforcement situation, when it comes to clandestine surveillance, nothing else will do. So, drug dealers beware. Even in the middle of the remote Mojave Desert, you're not necessarily alone. Because somewhere high above, there might just be a silent, hovering eye recording your every move. Coming up, we journey to the centre of the Earth in search of an essential mineral and kick around the problem of making the most advanced football in the world. Next, on How Do They Do It? Fertilizer. Every year we need millions of tons of it to feed the crops that nourish the world. So how do they mine and refine this invaluable food for fields? 
How do they do it? In the United States alone, there are over 50 million acres of wheat. But in order to grow crops on such vast scale, farmers need to provide them with more nourishment than is found in soil alone. What they need is a little help from fertiliser. And one of the most important ingredients in fertiliser is potassium salt. It's this valuable salt which helps crops retain nutritious sugars and boost their resistance to disease. The main source of potassium salt is from a mineral called potash. The problem is that while some potash occurs naturally in the topsoil, there's nowhere near enough to feed our hungry modern crops. So, in order to get enough of this essential mineral, they need to dig deep. And here in Balby, North East England, is Europe's deepest potash mine. This one mine produces over half of all the potash used in Britain. It's 8am and a team of 400 miners are making a marathon journey which will take them over 1,200 metres down towards the centre of the earth. This mine is so deep you could stack three Empire State buildings inside this shaft and still not reach the surface. When these guys step out of the lift, more than 1,200 metres under the Earth's crust, they arrive in an incredible subterranean tunnel system totalling a staggering 900 kilometres. But their journey doesn't end here, because next they must travel another 20 kilometres, far out under the North Sea, to the pit face currently being mined. The potash they are mining was formed millions of years ago, when a prehistoric ocean covered this part of Britain. As this primeval ocean evaporated, it left behind rich seams of salt. These contain both ordinary rock salt and the highly valuable potassium salt, or potash. Each of the seams is up to 20 metres thick, and every day these miners are tasked with hacking out 16,000 tonnes. That's the same weight as 80 jumbo jets. This leak keeps the company going and it pays me my wages. Yep. Nice job, to you, but I've got to get away, lad. It's a hazardous business. The potash they're mining is crumbly, and consequently walls can collapse without warning. In fact, when potash was first mined, it was one of the most dangerous jobs on Earth. So in order to make it safer, a team of geologists first decide where to dig, and then ten huge remote-controlled digging machines set to work. This is the 1060 Ellie miner. It actually cuts into the, into the seam of potash, chills away at the face, cuts the face, puts it into this car, shuttle car, sends it to conveyors. After a while, it's, it's like driving a car. You know, once you got used to it, you never forget how to drive early mine. These huge remote diggers allow them to safely mine the potash in shaley sections without prior blasting. Powered by electricity via cables from the surface, each of these subterranean monsters can chew out 200 tonnes of potash every hour. Meanwhile, the entire mine is continuously monitored with a digital micro-seismic system to ensure safety. But gouging the potash out is only the start of a long journey from bedrock to meadow. The mining machines discharge into electric shuttle cars. These run to feeder breakers which break the potash into a manageable size. Via a special shaft, the bite-sized potash then travels over a kilometre to the surface, moving at 18 metres per second on a giant conveyor belt. In theory, the raw potash could be sprinkled straight onto the soil. In fact, that's exactly what organic farmers do. But to make the potash more effective, they need to extract the valuable potassium salt from the clay and sodium salt that it's bound to. To do this, the rock is first crushed and then put through a series of soakers, which separate the potassium salt from the ordinary salt and clay. Next, it's dried and screened and converted to granules by a compaction circuit. The result is user-friendly granules of pure potash fertiliser, ready to be scattered across fields all over Britain. It's been an epic journey, from prehistoric ocean to subterranean bedrock, via an incredible process of mining and refining to ultimately produce sacks of farmyard fertiliser, without which there'll be no toast on our breakfast table.
top soccer players earn so much money, it's a wonder they don't employ someone else to play the game for them. And in a World Cup final, they expect that round thing they hoof around the park to be every bit as perfectly formed as they are. So how do they design the most technically advanced football ever for the world's biggest sporting fixture? How do they do it? Soccer, football, the beautiful game. Call it what you will, it's quite simply the most popular sport on earth. The obsession began 150 years ago, when a bunch of upper-class English schoolboys decided to spend the afternoon kicking an inflated pig's bladder. Such were the benefits in those days of paying for a private education. And whilst